So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about Doctrine 2.0. Um, how many of you are familiar with Doctrine or have used it? Any previous versions? How many? All right. So first, I'm going to tell you a little about myself. My name is Jonathan Wage. Um, I've been a web developer for over a decade. Um, pretty much been a tech junkie my whole life. Um, from a very young age, I was involved um, with electronics and learning circuitry. Um, and that was basically my introduction into getting involved with programming and other technology related things. Um, today, I contribute to Doctrine and Symphony and some other open source projects. Um, and I'm employed full time by Sensio Labs with uh, Fabian. Um, here's some information if you want to get a hold of me and ask questions, um, which hopefully after today you all will have some questions. Um, some history about the project itself. Doctrine was started on April 13, 2006, or at least that was when the first commit was made. Um, when the project actually started, that's up in there. Um, we released the first uh, stable version um, in September 1st of 2008, about two years after it was started. Um, so a lot of development and time went into the project before we actually had a first uh, stable version. Um, it was one of the fir very first uh, true RM implementations in PHP. Um, there were a lot of other, you know, object relational mappers for PHP, but nothing that really um, followed a lot of the same specifications that exist in other languages like Java. <clears throat> the 1.0 version um, was a long-term support release, um, and it's maintained until March 1st, 2010. Um, and that version 1.0 is also integrated with a lot of other popular frameworks like Zen Framework, CodeIgniter, and of course Symphony. Um, the team, it's pretty small. Um, it consists of about five people. Um, we have Roman, uh, Guerlame, Benjamin, we have Bulat, and then of course myself. So, some of you, you may ask, you know, what is an object relational mapper? And, you know, the best definition, I just pulled it straight off of Wikipedia. Um, but basically, it just allows you to map two incompatible types. You have a relational database, and when you're dealing with a programming language, you have an object-oriented language. And you want to work with that data in an object-oriented way and be able to translate that data back into your relational database. So before I actually talk about Doctrine 2, I want to show you some differences between Doctrine 1 and Doctrine 2. No, so this is what a model would look like in Doctrine 1. Um, I'll point out a few things. You notice how we have to extend a base class called Doctrine Record. And we also have to have this method, public function, set table definition. So then, of course, you can use it like this. You get some magic methods like save. You get all the magic um, set username, get username, set password. You know, all that seems great at first, um, but there are some problems with having to do those things, having to extend the base class and getting those magic methods. Um, by having to extend that base class, that means that our domain is bound to the persistence layer that we're using. So I can't just use these entities, these objects, and persist them anywhere. They're directly bound to the persistence layer. And usually in an object-oriented world, you know, having hard-coded dependencies like that, um, you know, it can, it can cause problems. Um, so also being bound to the persistence layer, the complexity of our entities and our domain are limited by what the persistence layer allows us to do. Um, you know, again, like I said, the save, all those magic methods that are added to your domain entities, it seems great and all, um, but there's a lot of overhead of having those methods. Save becomes a bottleneck if you ever want to persist large batches of entities. Because I have to call the save operation for every single entity, that means that I can't do batch inserts, or I can't you know, um, basically batch insert, or batch update, batch delete. It requires me to is issue one individual delete save um, statement per, per entity. Um, and it'd be, because you have to extend that doctrine record, testing your domain model um, can be pretty difficult. You have to mock out all those dependencies. So we have all those problems, and then the doctrine two way um, aims to solve a lot of those problems. So no longer do you have to extend a base class. So now you're just working with regular vanilla PHP objects, and they're pers persisted transparently. So here's what an entity would look like with Doctrine 2, and you'll notice that it's just a regular PHP object with regular properties, 
<clears throat> and you define your manual getters and setters. <clears throat> And the mapping information that you saw in the previous example in the set table definition, that information is completely separated from the domain entities themselves. So your, your entities are no longer bound to the persistence layer. In this example, we're using doc block annotations to provide the mapping information. Um, but I'll show you later. You can actually provide this information via XML, YAML, annotations, uh, raw PHP code. Um, so it's really up to you how you map your objects to Doctrine. So like I said, the mapping information can be specified with XML, YAML, doc block annotations, or PHP code. And the great thing about the way all this works is the mapping information is in the end stored in one place. Whether it comes from XML, YAML, PHP, or you store an array of data in a cache database, in the end, the same class gets instantiated with the same data. Where that data comes from, Doctrine doesn't care. So when we parse it from XML or parse it from YAML, we don't do that every single time. We just part of cache the information and then the next, uh, all subsequent requests to pull it from the cache. So here's what that same mapping information that you saw just a second ago on the annotations that we would specify as YAML. So now, if we were to go back and look at our entity, you know, those doc blocks and the annotations, they wouldn't be there. It would just be a regular vanilla PHP object. So this mapping information is used so that Doctrine knows what to do with each type of object and how it should be managed. So here's the same mapping information if you decided that you liked XML. Um, the, the biggest differences between all these, XML, um, it's my personal favorite because it has IDE auto-completion, um, has validation because there's an actual grammar, there's rules that are allowed that you can use in the XML. So if you make a mistake, you know, it's going to tell you. It's going to tell you what, what, what your problem is. Um, annotations, um, it, the benefit of using annotations is that, you know, your, your domain and your mapping information are all in one place. Um, that can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing because on a really, really large project with lots of entities in a very large domain, um, it can get very, very hard to manage with everything all in the same place. So for large projects, typically I like to have my domain entities separate, just clean PHP code, and then the mapping information in XML that lives somewhere else. So here's just the raw PHP code. So basically this API that you see right here, when we populate, when we parse an XML file or YAML file, we're basically just taking this information and we're just calling these methods and passing that information onto this container. And then these objects are what are cached in APC or Memcache or whatever. <clears throat> so again, I mentioned earlier transparent persistence. This is like the number one rule that we follow in Doctrine 2. Um, is we want the persistence of our entities to be completely transparent. And that means that no dependencies to our, our persistence layer should exist. It means that our entity should work without our persistence layer present. And if that is possible, that means that we can test our entities with PHP unit without having to do any special mocking because they're just regular PHP objects. So here's that same example with a Doctrine 2 entity with the set username and set password. And these are physical methods. Instead of using an, a magic underscore call, you know, that's defined in that magic Doctrine record, you know, they're just regular met methods with regular properties, and then Doctrine is able to persist these objects transparently. So I have this new user object that the state is not managed yet by Doctrine. When I pass it to the persist function, it's now telling Doctrine, okay, I have this object, you know the mapping information about it, I'm ready for you to manage its persistence. So now when I pass it to that persist method, inside of Doctrine, it's, as far as it's concerned, it has a new object. And when you call flush, it's going to go through all the managed objects, and it's going to calculate what changes have occurred. Now it knows that this is a new object, so it results in an insert statement. Um, the single flush operation, like I mentioned earlier on, the save is a bottleneck, because you can only insert one record at a time per save. But with Doctrine 2, we have one flush, so the <clears throat> it's basically best to build up all the changes in memory in your application of all your objects, and then you can persist them with one flush call. And Doctrine will calculate the change sets that occurred, literally you know, down to the individual properties of every single entity, and it knows what properties have changed. 
And then from that information, it can then persist that information to a relational database. Um, it can persist it to MongoDB, it can persist it to XML files, whatever you want. So that's the idea of transparent persistence and the fact that you know we're just managing the states of objects and the change sets that occur between flushes. Um, what is done with that information, like I said, whether it's persisted to a relational database or Mongo or something, um, is possible because of that. So here's another situation where I fetch an existing object. Um, so I get back from this find by method, I get a managed object. So this object is managed by doctrine internally. So then when I change the password and I call flush, it's going to loop through internally all the managed objects. It's going to see that the password property has changed and it's going to issue a SQL update statement to update that record in the database. So again, about the transparency, you know, that's the biggest thing. Why, should, why is it important to have transparency? Um, I don't think I mentioned it here, but the, the primary one is you know, the ability to swap out persistence layers with your domain model. You know, I may choose that, you know, later on I want to persist my domain model or a certain piece of my domain model to um, MongoDB or some other database. Um, if your domain is bound to the persistence layer that you started with, then, you know, doing that is not so easy anymore. You have to refactor a lot of code in order to make it work. Um, because of the transparency and the fact that we're just dealing with raw PHP objects, the performance is a lot better. Um, we're not going through the magic underscore underscore call method to do our setting and getting anymore. We're just using regular PHP objects. So the overhead of working with your domain entities is just like it would be if you weren't using any persistence layer at all. And like I mentioned before, uh, it makes it easy to test your domain because no mocking is required. If you keep your domain entities very clean and clean and clean of dependencies, and simply keep them domain entities, essentially just value objects, um, with the domain logic inside, then testing is really easy. And again, the, the flexibility of your domain is no longer controlled by the persistence layer, You're only limited by what PHP's object-oriented functionality allows you to do. So if you can describe it in, in PHP objects, 99.9% um, .9 of the cases you can, can be mapped with doctrine. I already mentioned some of this stuff. The, fifth, the biggest thing, the physical accessors and getters, you know, that's going to be the, a lot of your application code is, is a lot faster because of that. So PHP 5.3 is also a big reason why, um, well, I've, let me see, uh, Doctrine 1. Um, we, when we upgraded PHP 5.3 for Doctrine 1, we noticed that the test suite ran the 30% less memory and about 20% faster. I mean, that's, you know, those aren't exact numbers, but basically, just by changing the PHP version, Doctrine 1 gets a significant boost. Um, so with a library like Doctrine 2 being completely object-oriented, um, you know, you, you get a benefit by using PHP 5.3. So even if you're not using Doctrine 2, Doctrine 1, my point is, um, it's a really good idea to upgrade to 5.3. <clears throat> So here give you some examples. In Doctrine 1, to hydrate 5,000 records, or 1.1, it took about 4.3 seconds. In Doctrine 2, the same result set takes about 1.4 seconds. And for double the amount of records, it's still faster than Doctrine 1.1. So that's partly because of PHP 5.3, but also just because the um, hydration algorithm and all the code has been completely rethought from Doctrine 1 to 2. Um, so all the bottlenecks and problems of one we were able to fix. 